Hello. Welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bestrom, the Director of Public Programs and Education, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's program with Kenneth Anger. Um, we invited Kenneth Anger to come speak at the behest of artist Francesca Gabbiani. She's curated a beautiful exhibit, which you can see in the gallery upstairs. Um, the main imagery is of witchcraft and sorcery, and Francesca pulled these gems not only from the Hammer Museum collection, but also from the UCLA Biomedical Library and also some other UCLA special collections. So now I'd like to introduce Francesca Gabbiani. She's going to introduce Kenneth Enger. Um, Francesca was born in Canada and grew up in Switzerland and then studied art in Amsterdam before coming here and getting her MFA at UCLA. She's exhibited at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Lehman Loeb Art Center at Vassar College, and the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Geneva, among other venues. Um, she's recently had solo exhibitions at Patrick Painter in Santa Monica, the Laurel Reynolds Gallery in Austin, Monica de Cardenas in Switzerland, and the Sarah Meltzer Gallery in New York. And in 1991, she was part of the Hammer Museum's Hammer Project series. So please join me in welcoming Francesca Gabbiani. Um, hi. When I curated my show here at the Hammer, which is loosely based on the occult, I was asked to come up with ideas for related programs. I never thought that inviting Kenneth Anger talking about Alistair Crowley would be possible, and it really is a dream, a dream come true for me. I am very honored tonight to introduce you to a man who doesn't need any introduction. Avant-garde filmmaker and author of Hollywood Babylon, he will talk to us tonight about Alistair Crowley. Please welcome Kenneth Anger. and it's tattooed on my chest, so in case I forget. You see, people that get Alzheimer's suddenly can forget their own names. But I've got mine tattooed on my chest, so if they find my body, they can identify me. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to show it to you. At <laughs> any rate, I'm happy to be here. This is a, a lovely auditorium. I love this color of curtain <laughs> because it's subtle it's uh, plum I think I have made a new film about the paintings of uh, Alistair Crowley uh, he took up painting now are there people here that don't know a thing about him I guess everyone knows when he was born, 1875. In a so I'm going to just repeat some very obvious things. Born in 1875 in a little town in England and died in 1974 in a little town in England. Um, he didn't take up painting until he was approaching 40. And the first official oil painting he did was in Greenwich Village in 1919. And somehow he came upon a canvas screen that didn't have any images on it, but it was made of canvas. And basically, it was a triptych, because you have a center thing, and then you set the side pieces out like that. And that makes a triptych. Uh, images like that occur in many. Uh, uh, churches, and um, he was in his diary. He shows that he was quite determined to add another bow to his lyre, which was painting. And he, he bought uh, high quality paints. He always bought the very best of everything. His writing paper was always the very best, 
and uh, you know, you could say, well, this is extravagant tastes because he ran through his money uh, from his brewery inheritance from his father by the time he was 30. Uh, traveling the world, he loved to clown, climb mountains, and he climbed K2, which is the second highest mountain in the world, uh, with an expedition, most of which survived. All of them did not survive, but Crowley survived. Uh, there were a few avalanches and other little things that happened on the way. But um, they got pretty high up, considering they didn't have any oxygen or anything. It was just, they did it just naturally. And he loved to climb mountains on many planes. I mean, real physical mountains and other kinds. So he had uh, spent the first half of his life, up to the age of 40, basically as a writer. He wrote books, poems, treaties, theories, enigmas, jokes, and all published in beautiful small editions. Uh, numbered and given to friends. He never tried to break into the mass market until much later. In the 20s, he had a financial problem, as happens to many artists, uh, which is a challenge. In other words, can you survive running out of money? Can you think of anything to make some money in a hurry when you need it? Well, Crowley did. He sort of drew on his past experiences and turned out a pot boiler called Diary of a Drug Fiend, of which uh, you know uh, he had experienced uh, a few substances, mind-altering substances, over the years, and so he cranked those out uh, with another uh, a couple of those sort of pot boiler things, and it did help him financially uh, later on his, in his life. Crowley was not afraid of devils. In fact, they were part of his family. He was never afraid of anything on the other side. Angel, devil, whatever. You know, these are names you put on entities. But he said, welcome friend. You know, I, I, there were some that he banished. The one that had most trouble with was called Coronzone, which means chaos. All of us have that battle in our life, in our homes trying to keep order with all our things. I like things, and I'm a pack rat, and I have boxes piled up to the ceiling that I absolutely refuse to throw away. They include newspapers that my grandmother gave me. Uh, she worked for Rudolph Valentino as a silent costume maker, and she gave me the original newspapers of Valentino's life and death, and I've got them in plastic in a box. and. I've been collecting newspapers ever since, which, uh, like the fire people came into my hotel where I'm living now in uh, Hollywood, and I've been declared officially a fire hazard. <laughs> the, uh, when he undertook this experiment in the 1920s, starting in uh, April, uh, around the spring equinox that we're entering into right now, he left Paris with a heavy suitcase of the best quality uh, pr uh, French oil paint in tubes. In other words, this wasn't any Andy Warhol house paint. It was the very best colors that he could buy, and the same that Van Gogh used and, and other great painters in, in France. Um, he always went for quality. And he didn't want to have a problem with running out, so he, he brought plenty of paint with him. And he ended up p painting his bedroom in this uh, uh, farmhouse that he rented. And he re it was called the Villa Santa Barbara, an 18th century farmhouse on a hill overlooking Chefalu, which is a, a rather quiet uh, tourist place now. <laughs> I mean, uh, it. It, it, that Chefalu means the, the great skull or the rock, because there's this tremendous rock which dominates the town, which is Chefalu or Chefalodium. It's the big skull. And it's gorgeous. It's very powerful. And on top are 
ruins of ancient temples because it's various cultures have moved through that area in Sicily. And uh, but Crowley chose the hillside looking at Cefalu, the big the big rock, not he going up on top where the ruins of Phoenician and uh, Grecian and Roman things uh, remain. He um, got so carried away with the joy of painting that he began to paint like Gauguin, that was his model, his hero. The rooms of his house, you know, in, in the island that uh, Gauguin lived on. He ended up painting all the, the walls. I mean, he was surrounded by painting. So Crowley had the idea to do the same thing. He started in the bedroom, and he said, this is la chambre de cauchemar. And of course, that means the, cha the chamber of nightmares. But Crowley's nightmares were a bit funny, a bit uh, not scary, well, at least not to him. And so above his bed, was a great goat having intercourse with a red-headed woman, who of course would be the Scarlet Woman. And you do have this recurring of sexual images, because uh, basically that's what Crowley was all about. His religion was solar, not lunar. Solar, phallic religion. A man's religion that allowed women in, the so-called lunar element, but it was dominated by men. You know, if you, if you want the other side, go join Wicca. <laughs> because Crowley was quite uh, adamant that it was his, uh, the thing he was setting up was solar, and, and he was the boss, you know. Uh, democracy really didn't come into it all that much. But then there was the question while they were all living together. I mean, it was it's what I call the first commune. This is 1920. I suppose there were, you can find other groups of people with like minds uh, at earlier dates. But there's several women, an ex sailor, and then various people dropped in, you know, and stayed f for a while, including one student from England. Raoul Loveday, that disobeyed Crowley when they were climbing in the extreme heat of summer. And Crowley said, never take even a sip of that water. And Raoul Loveday disobeyed. He was parched and it was horribly hot. And, and he went down and took a sip of water and died of typhoid. Well, he disobeyed. And then the story got back to England and the Daily Express, which was run by Lord Beaverbrook, and they made a big thing about Crowley having human sacrifice in Sicily. And so this image built up, which is still around, of Crowley being the wickedest man in the world. And wickedest man in the world has a kind of pleasant alliteration. And, and Crowley loved alliterations and used them a lot maybe overuse them. But he couldn't get rid of this uh, label, wickedest man in the world, there he is. And in London, in later years, he stayed in London right through the Blitz. He rather enjoyed war. It was like a game of chance. You never knew whether you'd get through the night or not. He never went into bomb shelter in the whole time. He lived at 93 German Street, uh, just around the corner from Piccadilly, and bombs were hitting all around during the Blitz. And he said, there goes another one, he writes in the diary, and then some witty little comment about how life is a game of chance, you know, you never know uh, what your chance will be. I mean, all of us, a meteor may be on its way right now, we really don't know. <laughs> but. Uh, Crowley and I have always been on the same wavelength because he has the kind of sense of humor that I absolutely am at one with. And I said, wow, he, he's hip in the way that I think I'm hip. <laughs> but we get the same gags. 
Now, Crowley loved movies. This is absolutely not known unless you've read every single bit of his diary, which I have. There was a little cinema in the town of uh, Chefalu where he watched movies. I'm talking about 1921 to 1923, when Mussolini finally caught up with what he was doing down there and expelled him. But during that time, They'd walk down the hill, about a 15-minute walk, into the town of, of uh, Chefalu, and there'd be this little rinky-dink movie house that didn't even have seats like you. It had board benches. And the silent films were run with a little rinky-dink piano, a live accompaniment, which is always so nice to have a live music with a silent images. And he said he would make tantalizing descriptions. Another Senate, he'd say. In other words, a Max Senate comedy. And he loved Max Senate so much, I think they played more comedies than anything else in the, in the uh, little uh, movie house, that he wrote a script for a silent Max Senate type comedy that's absolutely brilliant. And if I ever could find another patron, like my patron that died a few years ago, bless his soul, uh, Sir Paul Getty, who's no longer with us except in spirit. Um, he incidentally uh, endowed my film uh, Mouse Heaven because we're both very fond of Mickey Mouse. But I'd love to make spaghetti. It's a story of obsession, about one man's uh, obsession with spaghetti, the stuff you eat. And it was his comment on Italy. Because you see, in Italy, whenever they run out of ideas about what to have for dinner, they just have spaghetti. You know, it's, it's sort of, it fills you up and it's a fall, a fall, something to fall back on or be careful that you could slip in it. And so, um, I'd like to make, you know, make a long feature with uh, a script by Alistair Crowley called Spaghetti, but I probably never will unless I find another patron. I do have one patron right now. See, I haven't run out totally of patrons. <clears throat> Her name is Agnes B. Do any of you know who I'm talking about? Okay. Well, Agnes B. is an art patron, and she's now married a man named Trouble. <laughs> Trouble. <laughs> but... For me, she's still Agnes V, and that's the name on her boutiques, which are all over the world. And she does do quality clothes for uh, not as expensive as some other places. <laughs> because she, she believes in democracy, and so do I, basically. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to see something I want to buy and have it be, you know, these sort of couturier prices. Um, but you can buy good things at Target. And occasionally I have a handwritten note with a signature still has a kind of life to it. And that's why I am totally opposed to our present age of computers and all of that, that is reducing everything to ciphers. And it's so wrong. I'm sorry. Please. If you love someone, please write them a handwritten note. Okay. And that handwriting will have power and maybe even get you a little love back. So I'm going to uh, wind this up now. I do not do Q&As, and I decided that years ago. But if anyone has any great question about me that I've contradicted myself or left out an important piece of information, I do accept letters and I answer them with a 42 cent stamp. I guess it's going up in a few months. I, by, I think May. They're, you know, they continue to jack it up. I said I won't write any more letters when it gets to be 50 cents. <laughs> but I'll probably relent. So, in my opinion, uh, the old sinner, as my friend Gerald York called him, and he, he, he knew him awfully well, 
Uh, but that was a, a little bit of a, a poke in the ribs. Uh, was and is a great artist in, on various levels. A poet, a novelist, a writer of incredible uh, fantasies, and then when he moved into the visual arts, a skilled painter in oil and a damn good uh, renderer in watercolor. And I'm s sure that in the time remaining for me personally as an artist, other material will come forth on Crowley and I will return. In other words, I haven't said the last thing about him. And even though I've had friends and patrons uh, you know, say, well, if you had Paul Getty for a patron, uh, what's your problem? Well, the problem is that Paul Getty died <laughs> at age 70. And I had prepared a wonderful film for him. I storyboard. All the pictures were drawn out with a bow to Whistler. You know, Whistler called things arrangements. Well, my film that I was making, commissioned for Sir Paul Getty, was Arrangement in White on Green. And of course, it was a film about that mysterious activity in England called cricket, which uh, some people consider as fascinating as watch watching paint dry. But I learned all the rules of cricket and know a bat from a wicket and so forth. And it's a pity that the film never got made. But when uh, Sir Paul died a few years ago, he basically didn't write a will, and so the uh, I got nothing, and his wife, Victoria, is not a fan, a fan of Kenneth Anger. <laughs> because um, Sir Paul was generous enough to give me a carte blanche open ticket on Virgin Atlantic. I could fly upper class anywhere in the world, and he would just take care of it. And I did not overuse it, but I did use it a bit, mostly to visit him. But the day after he died, uh, this privilege of a Virgin Atlantic uh, ticket uh, for a close circle of uh, Sir Paul's friends was canceled. All 12 of us were canceled the next day by Victoria, Lady Victoria. And. Uh, we're still cordial, I would say hello and so forth. But at <laughs> any rate, so patronage can be whipped away from you in an instant by the great whipper awayer, de <laughs> death. And my most recent film that you're not going to see is going to be premiered in Beijing, China, that knows a thing or two about death. Uh, and it's called D E A T H, death. And China commissioned it. They don't know what's in it yet. <laughs> because, you see, I belong to f something here in America called Free Tibet. And I'm very serious about it. And we all are. <laughs> so my way in the film that was paid for and commissioned by the Chinese is I included most exquisite examples of Tibetan skulls of mystics decorated with silver inlay. And they're museum pieces. They belong to a friend of mine. And you can see them actually at the Museum of Death here in um, this rather odd but wonderful uh, city of Los Angeles. And they're located on Hollywood Boulevard. The, the Museum of Death, and, and they were very generous in letting me photograph their rarest pieces. So I think that's about all. And since I don't do Q&A, uh, however, I do love the feeling I get from the audience. <laughs> and um, I, do any of you, were any of you here when the, the um, intro music was being played? Did any of you recognize what it was? 
hey, Jonas Brothers, somebody got right. <laughs> OK, well, what is my connection with the Jonas Brothers? <laughs> the, OK, there is one. And this is the first time a public announcement. And you see, they're under contract to some, an entity called D-I-S-N-E-Y, Disney. And Disney made a rather fascinating uh, concert film of them in uh, a beautiful th system of 3D called Real D. And uh, it played at the um, El Capitan. It's over now, but it played there for two weeks. And the first days, I mean, the girls were sleeping overnight to get in. You know, they have to do this. This is the. Uh, between 13 and 16, that's the fans of the uh, Jonas Brothers, uh, so far. <laughs> and uh, they're sleeping. They want to suffer for whoever they ad adore, which is not a bad system. It's a very ancient system, actually. <laughs> and so these girls just laid right down there on this car. Uh, side, uh, con uh, si concrete cold sidewalk overnight for 72 hours, I think, some of them, to be the first in the theater when it opened to play the Jonas Brothers 3D concert experience. <laughs> and this is damn good 3D, real D. And I would like to remake my uh, film Mouse Heaven that's a homage to an early creation of the Disney entity, which is called Mickey Mouse, uh, I'd like to remake it in real D. Expensive, but uh, the, if, if the uh, Disney people ever said OK, I could. And it would be a 10-minute short that they could stick on the front of one of their many 3D pr projects that are now coming out. I mean, they, they're trying to, we do have to wear little glasses. But aside from that, of course, if you already wear glasses, it's a problem like glasses on glasses, but at any rate, they're quite comfortable and they don't give you a headache. So maybe I'll be able to come back here with uh, Mouse Heaven, and it's called Mouse Heaven because my lawyer said, please don't call it Mickey Mouse Heaven because they'll be all over your tail. They will. I mean, Mickey Mouse is a copyright entity uh, as a name. But my f uh, have any of you seen M Mouse Heaven? Okay, well, it is a study of the world's best collection of Disney toys and artifacts from 1928 to 1935, when they were at their stylistic peak. And uh, I, it's a collection of Mel and Eunice Bernkrant in uh, uh, Cold Spring, New York, which is on the river opposite West Point. And they said, um, sure, bring it back and we'll do it and redo it in 3D. So maybe that'll happen. I'm hoping. OK, thank you for being such a great audience. You'll be the one that moves me.